Well, welcome to Christ and Culture. This is Pastor Jeff Short, your Bible teacher and cultural analyst. And today we're going to be talking about the phenomenon of Pope splaining. That is, people who go out of their way to try to make the Pope's statements, even if they're contradictory, even if they're heretical, even if they're leading the church astray, departing from historic orthodoxy, biblical fidelity, whatever, they make, they try to make those statements harmonize with Christianity. So they're called Pope Splainers. They're explaining what the current Pope, Pope Francis, really meant when he said some off the cuff gaff, makes some gaff or mistake, or makes some actual outright material heretical statement. They are there to quickly mop up the mess that he created. Now, Pope Francis, the current pontiff, is famous for his statement on World Youth Day early on in his pontificate where he told the young people in South America, he said, go out and make a mess. Well, Pope Francis has taken his own advice and has gone out and made a mess over the last 10 years. And he has brought upon himself criticism and outright dissent an outright denunciation by many, many people in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, as a Protestant Christian, as a Bible-believing Christian, I sit back and watch this whole thing because I see a lot of the criticisms that were leveled in the Reformation time against the Roman Catholic Church and against the magisterium, so-called, of the Vatican administrative state and the Pope himself. These criticisms are now being mouthed in the voices of traditional Catholics. So against Pope Francis, who has tried to consistently over the last 10 years, tried to take the Roman Catholic Church in a liberalizing, worldly direction. Now, there are some people called Pope Splainers, like I mentioned before, who try to go along and tidy up the words and statements of Pope Francis. One of them is Michael Lofton, who has a program and probably puts out a a video on the internet every single day, because that's almost what you have to do with Pope Francis. You have to go behind him and clean up his mess, because he's making a mess of everything that he's touching and everything he says is probably there's something wrong with it, because he is not very precise. Now, remember, the last pope, Pope Benedict XVI, or Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, before he was pope, was a very precise speaker. And when you ask him a question, he will give you a straightforward answer. As a Protestant, I appreciate that. I love it when someone is very upfront and frank, and they're not trying to be coy, and they're not trying to be obscure and obfuscate and all of these other maneuvers that politicians and leaders of all stripes try to do when they don't want to offend people. This Pope Benedict the 16th was very clear in his words, very precise in his language, and he represented for the most part historic traditional Catholicism. And that's always appreciated when you get someone who actually will state what the historic position of the Roman Catholic Church is. And then you can talk about specific points of problems and errors in the Roman Catholic Church. For example, on the dogmas related to Mary, uh, at least Ratzinger would, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, would at least state what the Catholic Church believes. Pope Francis is trying to change what the Catholic Church believes about all kinds of things. Uh, most uh, notorious, for example, was his change of the statement of the Catholic Church on the death penalty. And so he doesn't like the death penalty, and so he's basically outlawed the death penalty in the Roman Catholic Church. And that is a change because the Roman Catholic Church has always recognized, as most Christian uh, bodies and churches have always recognized, that there is a time, there is a place for capital punishment based on the heinous crime that was committed and brought before the judge. Now, if the judge decides that this person committed first-degree murder or some heinous crime, the judge could impose the death penalty 
on the person, and that was totally in line and consistent with the biblical teaching. For example, in Genesis 9-6, it says, uh, if you shed the blood of, of a man, you your blood shall be shed in retaliation. So uh, we're talking about murder, not killing. Now, there are justified killings in, for example, times of war, in a just war. So this has all been worked out for 2,000 years, and Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox all pretty much agree on the basic understanding of the just war theory and capital punishment. Well, Pope Francis comes along and he says, no, I'm going to change that. And he actually does make a change in the Roman Catholic Catechism, the official teachings of the church. And now it says that it is inadmissible. The death penalty is inadmissible, never to be done. So he is changing the doctrines of the church. He's teaching, uh, changing the teachings of the church and yet there are people like Michael Lofton. Uh, it looks like now David Gordon, who was an apologist that worked with Church Militant, very critical of the bishops and the Pope. And now it looks like David Gordon has switched and he's now being loyal to the Pope and loyal defender of the Pope. Whatever the Pope says, there's got to be some way. And it's even funny because Michael Lofton will a- actually say that uh, what Pope Francis says is difficult, but we can take some WD-40 and we can grease that and lubricate that and spin that and make that work out. It'll all come out okay. He hasn't contradicted church teachings for this, that, and the other reason. So he actually knows what he's doing. He's he's spinning, he's, he's force-fitting something that Pope Francis has said that's wrong, and he's making it right by some kind of sophistry, and he knows what he's doing. But he feels it's justified because in the Roman Catholic system, there is a pope, and he is supposed to be the vicar of Christ on earth. He's supposed to be the spokesman of Christ on earth, infallible when he speaks from the chair, when he speaks ex cathedra, that's what that Latin phrase means, ex cathedra, from the chair. When he speaks that way, he is infallible. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. And Michael Lofton actually takes that very seriously. And even when the Pope doesn't speak ex cathedra, the faithful, supposedly in the Roman Catholic Church, are supposed to take that seriously too, uh, even though there is some wiggle room in the teachings of what the Pope has the authority to say and what he doesn't. Uh, so the Pope can make off the cuff statements. That isn't binding on the conscience of Catholics. But then when he gives a pastoral letter or when he gives a magisterial document, uh, these are supposed to be taken seriously. Uh, Maybe not infallible, that's what the apologists say, but uh, seriously nevertheless. So Michael Lofton, whenever the Pope speaks, he's always going to find a way to harmonize whatever the Pope says with traditional Catholic teachings, even if he has to use, he says, WD-40 and sort of lubricate that and force fit it into the proper categories. So he's very upfront. He says, this is what our Catholic faith demands, he says, to other Catholics. And so when he sees people criticizing Pope Francis, who who are Catholics, for example, like EWTN, uh, Raymond Arroyo, on his weekly show, The World Over, he has a so-called papal posse, uh, Gerald Murray, who's a canon lawyer in New York, a priest, and you have another gentleman who is an editor and author uh, who writes for The Catholic Thing, and these so-called papal posse members get together and they criticize Pope Francis and they come right out and say that what he's teaching in many instances is material heresy and all kinds of things like that. And and Michael Lofton looks at that and says, that is not permissible. You cannot criticize the Pope in that way. But everybody is doing it is seemingly like, um, for example, Timothy Gordon, uh, brother of David Gordon. Uh, Timothy Gordon now does criticize the Pope And he's even to the point where saying, well, he doesn't know whether the Pope is actually a legitimate Pope or not. He's not going to make a pronouncement on that, but he's open to the possibility that the Pope may not actually be a legitimately uh, stationed Pope in the office because of circumstances around the Pope's selection and so forth. 
So he questions not only Pope Francis' status as a legitimate teacher, but he also questions the teachings of Pope Francis. And he, and he even says that Pope Francis is a heretic in some areas. So he's calling the Pope a heretic as a Roman Catholic. Again, Michael Lofton looks at someone like a Timothy Gordon and says, that is not legitimate. You cannot call the Pope a heretic if you're a Roman Catholic. So again, evangelicals are just looking at all of this play out and questioning what in the world is going on in the Roman Catholic Church because Pope Francis is dividing so many uh, traditional Catholics from other Catholics, more liberal Catholics or mainstream Catholics. Now, Michael Lofton, the apologist for Pope Francis, and he's not the only one. Uh, there are countless numbers of priests and bishops who are also pope splaining, And you'll get them all over the Vatican. You'll get them all over, for example, the United States Conference of Bishops. You'll get a lot of bishops there who will never come out and say that the pope is a heretic or that the Pope is teaching false teachings, or the Pope is wrong on this. They'll never come out and say that. Some do, and they get punished for it. So there's a, there's a pressure, there's a fear among Roman Catholic hierarchy to never speak out against the Pope because you'll be punished. And Pope Francis is not above punishing people. For example, there was a um, Raymond Cardinal Burke of St. Louis who was just recently demoted and basically kicked out of his apartment, and his stipend was taken away because he's a critic of Pope Francis. And also, the Bishop Strickland in Texas was removed from his diocese because he was a critic of Pope Francis. And you go on and on, and there are these retaliation removals by Pope Francis on uh, bishops who criticize him, priests. There was a priest recently I can't remember where, but I believe it was South America who actually called Pope Francis a usurper. He was removed from the priesthood. Uh, I think he was excommunicated even, I'm not sure. But yes, there are retaliatory moves taking place right now by the Vatican to remove these dissenting uh, hierarchical uh, clergy. And what in the world is this all about? Well, what the Pope Splainers like Michael Lofton are trying to say is that the only person who can actually call the Pope, Pope Francis, a heretic and actually criticize the Pope is another Pope that comes after him. So Pope Francis is doing all these things. He's dividing the Roman Catholic world. He's teaching uh, false teachings, even by biblical Protestant standards. So when Protestants look at Pope Francis, we see someone who is actually fighting against a strict biblical orthodoxy. He's actually trying to lead the Roman Catholic Church, and by extension, all Christians astray. Okay, so we see Pope Francis as a liberal. We've seen liberals before. We know how liberals talk. We have plenty of liberals in the Protestant world the mainline denominational churches. I came from a mainline United Methodist Church background, and for most of my teenage years, I was a part of a mainline liberal denominational United Methodist Church. I know how liberals speak. I know how liberals think and how they act, and there is a high correspondence between the spirit of the world, the secular world, and the way the liberal thinks. And the liberal's ideal is that the world and the church are all in harmony together. We get along with the world. The world gets along with us. We don't put up much resistance to what they say, and they let us uh, basically sit at the table and be a part of the discussion, and that's kind of the trade-off with the liberals have with the world. Well, we see that same attitude in Pope Francis. So we know that Pope Francis is a liberalizer, a secularizer, a worldly uh, clergyman, and so we oppose Pope Francis for the most part of what he's trying to do in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if he were trying to actually reform the Roman Catholic Church, and he was coming from a place of biblical orthodoxy, we would be all in favor of what he's trying to do. But he's not trying to do that. He's not actually trying to reform 
the Roman Catholic Church in the direction of the Reformers or Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or the second generation or third generation Reformers. He's not trying to reform the church by the Bible, the Word of God, the oldest source that we have to look at and judge anything. He's not trying to reform it by the Bible. He's trying to bring the Roman Catholic Church in line with the secular modern world. So he's a secularizing, liberalizing force in Roman Catholicism, and also that spillover effect takes place. So he's also quoted in the Protestant world and the, even the evangelical world. We saw, it was, I think, three or four years ago at Wheaton College, my old alma mater, a flagship evangelical college and institution. And there was a professor, Laricia Hawkins, who got into a controversial problem with the board and the administration at Wheaton College for actually quoting Pope Francis and saying that, according to Pope Francis, um, Muslims and Christians and Jews are all people of the book, and so we should um, we should get together and so on and so forth. She was actually promoting uh, a harmony and actually coming too close to the Muslim world, and she was actually fired from her position as a professor for not actually maintaining the lines between the Muslim doctrine and beliefs and the evangelical Bible-believing Christian doctrine and beliefs. So she was blurring those lines. Well, so you have this woman at Wheaton College who was a professor at an evangelical, orthodox evangelical institution quoting Pope Francis. So that's the problem. Pope Francis is a problem because he does have influence in the world. The secular world actually takes whatever he says as representative of Christianity when it's not. And he's coming under fire from more traditionalist Roman Catholics that can see that he's not representing uh, Orthodox Christianity. And he's also facing criticism, of course, from evangelical Protestant Bible-believing Christians like myself because he's not espousing um, a, a biblical Christianity. So I'm with the Roman Catholic traditionalists who are criticizing Pope Francis, but I also understand that they're not consistent in their criticism of Pope Francis because within the system of Roman Catholicism, Michael Lofton is actually more consistent in the fact that you're supposed to respect and listen to and follow what the Pope teaches, because he is supposed to represent the voice of Christ on earth. And if at their so-called enclave, when they select a Pope, they vote from amongst all the cardinals, they vote on a man to succeed the last Pope. When John Paul II died, they had an enclave in, what was it, 2013? And then they selected, and they believe sincerely that when they get together and they hold an enclave, that the Holy Spirit is the one that actually picks the Pope. And so Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was selected. He became Benedict the Sixteenth, And then when he abdicated uh, a few, about, I think, what, it was eight, eight years later or so, uh, and, well, in 2013, he abdicated. Uh, Pope John Paul II died earlier, so... Yeah, Pope John II uh, died earlier, closer to the turn of the millennium. Uh, and so Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was voted in, and then he abdicated, and then in 2013, Pope Francis came in. Now, the Roman Catholic Church believes that when these enclaves gather, they are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They take themselves very seriously. And so when Francis was produced as the next pope, they assumed that the Holy Spirit selected him. So, according to the Roman system, you're supposed to listen to the Pope, you're supposed to follow the Pope, you're supposed to heed the Pope, you're supposed to respect him, you're not supposed to criticize him, you're not supposed to correct him, and you're supposed to treat him as what the office means, and that is the vicar of Christ on earth. Now, as Protestants, we criticize that and say, look, that's not part of the biblical revelation. We don't have any individual 
in the New Testament after the ascension of Christ who serves in what is known as the papal office. Um, they, the Roman Catholics like to point to Peter as the first pope, but he did not do that in the first century in the biblical record. In fact, at the council, the Jerusalem council, the big meeting uh, to decide about the Gentiles coming into the church, Peter was not even the one that made the official decision. It was James. So why is James making that official pronouncement and acting as if he were the Pope, according to the Roman Catholic Church, when it's supposed to be Peter, according to the Roman Catholic Church? So there's so there is no papal office. There is no infallible voice that is invested in this office called the Pope. And so as Protestants, we say the office of Pope is illegitimate. There really is no biblical model for the Pope. So, but according to the Roman Catholic Church and its traditions, the development of the papal office, there is. And they're supposed to take it very seriously and they're not supposed to criticize him and they're supposed to respect his pronouncements and decisions. Well, what do you do with all these people like EWTN, um, Taylor Marshall now is an Orthodox Roman Catholic who is very critical of the Pope. He's written books a critical of the Pope, uh, actually calls him a heretic, but is not willing to say that he's not a Pope. Uh, there are some people like uh, former Catholic Answer spokesman Patrick Coffin, who actually says Pope Francis is an anti-Pope. Now, you're familiar with that if you're familiar with the Bible. There is an antichrist, and he's the false Christ that comes in the end times. Well, an anti-pope is one who assumes or usurps the position of pope, but he's really against or a false pope. And so Patrick Coffin, who used to work for Catholic Answers, this was an organization, Apologetics, who would defend the pope and the magisterium and the Vatican and Catholic teachings. Now he has turned against Roman Catholic uh, pope francis and says he is an anti-pope or a false pope so you have all of these people who are staunch catholics who are now denouncing the pope uh, the church militant organization i mentioned before that david gordon used to work for until this recent scandal over there in church militant and its founder michael voris had a very strict policy we will we will criticize the priests who are involved in corruption. We will criticize the bishops. We will criticize even the cardinals, like this Cardinal McCarrick, this scoundrel um, from the East Coast, uh, who was in view, uh, involved in abuse, uh, sexual abuse, and all kinds of things like that. So a high-ranking official in the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. But we will never ca uh, criticize the Pope. That was their rule for years and years and years. And then Pope Francis began to make all of these false teachings and heretical statements. And then finally, Michael Voris and Church Mill decided we are now criticizing the Pope. So people like Michael Lofton, who is the Pope's planning uh, representative, he is saying, you can't do that. And I have to actually agree, according to the Roman Catholic system, you can't do what so many of the critics of Francis are doing. You really can't make judgments against the Pope because he is the authority in the Roman Catholic Church. And I think some of them, like, for example, John Henry Weston uh, with LifeSite News, who is also a very strong critic of Pope Francis, along with Michael Matt of the Remnant uh, video and so on and so forth. You just go down the list of... Uh, Edward Penton, uh, Rome correspondent, go down the list and you will see that there are huge numbers of people, uh, some even including in the Roman Catholic hierarchy, priests, bishops, cardinals, who are critical of Pope Francis. But if you are going to look at the Roman Catholic system, it's very questionable whether these people are really permitted to and allowed in the Roman Catholic system to criticize the Pope the way they are. Uh, because, again, he's supposed to be the authority. So if you're 
a higher authority and you're being criticized by a lesser authority, how does that work? For in the military, for example, you can have lower ranking officers criticizing someone higher up, but all, all that is is just noise level. In order to do something about someone who's doing something wrong higher up, a higher up of that has to intervene and criticize, and then it can actually produce something real. But in the Roman Catholic system, if you're simply a member of a church, you're a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you cannot actually sit back and judge your pope and call him a heretic because that doesn't fit in your system. So Michael Lofton and the Pope Splainers and the Pope Apologists of Pope Francis, they're actually right. Uh, you're stuck with a bad pope. You're stuck with a heretic. You're stuck with a false teacher. You're stuck with possibly even a false pope, a usurper, uh, someone who has snuck in to the flock and is a, actually a wolf. And you're stuck with him because you can't remove the pope. Uh, lay people cannot remove the pope. Uh, even a council cannot remove a pope. Uh, according to, I think it was Vatican I, who actually says uh, there is no uh, earthly authority above the Pope. So you can't, there's no board of directors that can fire the Pope. No one can fire the Pope. No one can force him to resign. Uh, the only criticism and anathema can come from a, another Pope after this one has gone. So and that has happened in the church before. Uh, Honorius was a really uh, bad pope and a heretic, and his predecessors had to actually, before they became popes, after Honorius, had to swear that Honorius was in fact a heretic and condemn him. So uh, only uh, future popes can actually condemn a pope. And that's the problem with the Roman Catholic system, and it's a problem that was brought upon the Roman Catholic system by itself because it's instituted an illegitimate office, and that is the Pope. And you want to know why Pope Benedict XVI resigned, abdicated his position as Pope, is because the crushing weight of the whole thing was too much for him, and we can well imagine why it was, because there's no legitimate office of a Pope, and there's no legitimate uh point where God lays upon the shoulders of one individual the weight of what the Pope is supposed to be, the vicar of Christ on earth. So not only is the office of the Pope illegitimate, we can see what happens when you follow that system. You're going to get this terrible contradiction right now where you have a false teacher and a false prophet who is the spokesman for the Roman Catholic Church, and there's nothing that the Roman Catholic Church can do to remove him. Uh, and all it can do is pray that maybe he passes away. But, but see, this is the contradiction in the Roman Catholic system. So my point is that these Pope Splainers and these people who are trying to square the, square the circle and say that two plus two is five, you know, that's the whole thing with uh, Ignatius of Loyola, the beginner uh, founder of the Jesuits, he said, if the Pope says black is white and white is black, I must assent to it and I must agree with it. So that's what they're trying to do. The problem is the system itself. So we need to pray that actual reformation comes to the Roman Catholic Church and maybe it will come about uh, because of the crisis of Pope Francis. So we'll just keep praying for that and we'll see you back next week.